What's up, y'all? Um, let's go ahead and talk. Um, don't worry, you see both of my hands are right here. Uh, I'm totally safe. Um, I, I, I have the phone set so I don't have to uh, hold it so I can focus on the road. <clears throat> now, um, let's just talk about before and now. There's a lot of people who don't understand uh, where we are with God. Um, a lot of people don't understand the Old Testament versus the New Testament. That these are two different ministries. The Bible calls the Old Testament the ministry of death and condemnation. It calls the ministry of the Spirit a glorious ministry. Or the New Testament ministry is the ministry of the Spirit. So one of them is the ministry of the flesh, which would be the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the ministry of the Spirit. Now, under the ministry of the flesh, which is the Old Testament ministry, judgment was different. I'm going to say that again for those who don't understand. Under the ministry of the Old Testament. Judgment was different. You were judged different. As a matter of fact, under some conditions, you could be held responsible for somebody else's sin. Yeah. Your forefathers in there. And it would be held against you even though you didn't do nothing just because you was connected to the bloodline. And you would be cursed based on what somebody else did. And sometimes the nation would be punished. <laughs> Whole group of people would be punished behind the faults of others instead of being judged individually. Not only that, but the judgment was based on works. Now, um, the problem with works, let me help you understand this, because if you don't understand this, you're going to be striving toward God in vain. Not only that, but you're going to have a misunderstanding of God. Uh, you'll misunderstand how he sees you. And you'll also misunderstand how he sees others. And you will stick with that, um, <clears throat> with that uh, image in your mind. And that character in your mind when God is not like that now. Okay, so the requirements of the Old Testament ministry, let me help you understand, we're talking Old Testament ministry now. The requirements under the Old Testament ministry was that in order to, for God to, to see you as righteous or holy or blameless, you had to be as good as he is. That, that was the requirement. You had to be as good as him. Now we know that nobody is as good as God or as holy as God. But under the Old Testament ministry, that's how you had to be in order to, uh, to be accepted based on your effort or based on your works. Now, the problem is you have already been born in violation to that. 
because you've been born in sin under the curse from when Adam and Eve sinned they um, they put a curse on uh, humanity so that everyone who is born is born in sin because of what Adam and Eve did so you were held accountable for their wrong and um, not that of your own so the judgment of God was kindled and um, as sin began to escalate God's anger began to uh, escalate as well and um, his wrath began to express more and more toward the nation that's the reason why when you read in the Old Testament you will find out that God was taking out nations doing things such as raining fire and brimstone on people um, doing things such as uh, turning folks into soap for looking back when he said go forward um, you would see God striking down people with no problem and just taking taking out uh, a lot of people for their sins and he was punishing them for every little thing that they did wrong and nobody was able to live up to his holy requirement and keep all of his laws I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments I'm talking about all of his laws which which goes further than just that <clears throat> nobody was able to measure up to um uh, those requirements <clears throat> so what happened is they would experience the wrath of God and the anger of God would be kindled against the nation and that's why you would see a lot of woes and uh, uh, I'm going to do this I'm going to do that I'm going to strike you this I'm going to strike you everything was a punishment Every, like almost every everything that God would say would always be like some hard stuff, you know, I'm going to get you back, you know, that sort of thing. He had that kind of attitude under the Old Testament because the requirements under the Old Testament was your works. But the people being uh, born in sin and uh, by nature, carrying sin nature, nobody could measure up to the holiness of God. So therefore, everybody experienced uh, punishment from God because of um, um, they couldn't measure up under that law. So the judgment was, uh, was, was dealt with personally whenever someone would make a mistake in their flesh. So, he, so God was going by the outside under the Old Testament, not the inside. He was going by the outside. So he was literally looking at everything that you was doing on the outside and holding that against you. And then taking his anger out on you and expressing that. And, uh, and people was experiencing wrath from, from God. And the only way that that wrath would temporarily go away is whenever they would bring a sacrifice uh, 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 to the high priest on Jubilee and sprinkle some of the blood from that sacrifice that animal in order to cause God's wrath to, uh, to turn away because that blood from that animal would then cause the sin to, to uh, eradicate from one year so, uh, so everything that they committed up to the time that they they brought the sacrifice in it would cleanse their past sins in order to take that off of God's mind and then the wrath of God would leave the people who had a sin offering and, uh, and it would take that off of God's mind for uh, for one year but everything else that they would do after that until the next jubilee 
would be held against them again and they would experience the anger of God over and over. So that's why you see God so angry in the Old Testament because the judgment was based on your works on the outside. At the same time, there was no sacrifice that was given that was good enough to cleanse for the past, present, and future. And the sacrifices that they offered, the animal sacrifices, were unclean itself. So, so that didn't last. It only, it only temporarily took away the sins for uh, that was previously committed. But it didn't do anything which was what with the sins that was about to be committed uh, and, and handle that. So God's anger would still come whenever um, whenever people would make mistakes later. And they would get right back to where they started and experience God's anger again. So they would be judged uh, accordingly and, and, and treated with a lot of anger and wrath from God. Now that's the Old Testament. Sometimes what we hear is people preach that still. <laughs> and we hear people preach God like that. <laughs> because they don't understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. <clears throat> so when things like coronaviruses happen and all of that, they start putting that on God because they're, dw they're dwelling on an Old Testament version of God when that's not who he is anymore. That's not how he responds anymore because, because the law that we're now under is, um, is a law where the requirements are different. Now, <clears throat> let me explain what happened with Jesus so that you can understand this because if you don't get this the cross and all of that and the crucifixion and all of that that's not going to make no sense to you you won't even see a reason why that needed to happen let me use this example let's just say that a father has a very valuable piece of equipment and that father has four sons okay <clears throat> let's say that three of those sons damage that valuable piece of equipment but one of those sons didn't do nothing wrong so one of the sons is innocent but the other three they're not innocent they're the ones responsible for damaging that equipment now let's say that that father was angry with those three sons that damaged that valuable piece of equipment and he wanted to punish them. And right when he was getting ready to punish them and make them pay for their mistake, the son who's innocent, who didn't do nothing wrong, said to that father, Punish me and let them go free. Don't whoop them, whoop me. I will take the punishment and I will take the penalty for uh, their breaking of that valuable piece of equipment. So now let's say that the father punishes those three sons. Um, not directly but the father instead of punishing those three sons punishes that one son who is innocent with a combined punishment that would be enough to cover the punishment of those three sons so now we have a son who didn't do nothing wrong being punished Behind the three sons who did something wrong, who are actually responsible for the breaking of that equipment. So really, they're the ones who deserve to be punished. 
But instead of them being punished, the son who's innocent steps in and says, punish me. So he takes the punishment and anger uh, and wrath of, of, of his father without a cause. Somebody else was the cause. The other three were the cause. He's not the cause. So he takes that punishment. He takes that penalty. And all of the father's anger and wrath is put on him. While the others go free. Who's actually guilty. They get to go free. And the one who's innocent don't go free. So he's taking the penalty for uh, the other's action. And now, since he has taken the penalty for the other's action, the others get to have peace with their father without any anger or wrath. Because he already expressed that on the innocent son. This is what Jesus did for you. All of your sin. Everything that you would ever do. Past, present, and future. All of your sin. The entire world's sins. All of it. Past, present and future God has already foreseen what everybody would do wrong and God had anger and rage and wanted to express wrath to take his hatred out on sin and so instead of you experiencing that punishment. Jesus steps in and he says, instead of punishing them and making them pay, punish me. Make me pay for their mistakes. For everything that they would ever do, make me pay. For their mistake. Punish me. Whatever you got to do to me. In order for you not to do anything to them. Do that to me. Okay, now listen. This involves past, present, and future. So all of God's anger and all of God's rage and all of God's wrath and all of God's, I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to get you back. I'm going to deal with your sin. All of that has been bundled up and expressed on the body of Jesus. So Jesus took the penalty for everybody's sin, past, present, and future. That's what the punishment was all about. That was God <clears throat> expressing his wrath toward the body of Jesus on your behalf. So that instead of you paying for it, You would not have to. So that instead of you experiencing anger from God, you will never experience that. So that instead of you experiencing God's wrath and God being mad at you and God holding everything you did wrong against you. Instead of that happening. So that you wouldn't have to experience that kind of response from God. So now, watch this. Remember, 
it involves your past, present, and future mistakes. So even the mistakes, even, the, watch this, even the sins that you have not yet committed, the anger, the wrath, and the rage of God has already been punished on the body of Jesus. Because again, he foresaw, he foreseen everything that you would ever do. And he took that punishment and punish that on the body of Jesus. So in God's eyes, he has already punished you for everything you would ever do wrong. That price has already been paid for. This is how Jesus made, uh, made peace between God and man. By taking the punishment for every man's sin, for every woman's sin, past, present, and future, all of that has been laid on the body of Jesus. Now, the Bible says that it is written, according to the book of Galatians, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. The Bible calls the cross, a cross was called a tree because it was made of wood. So when Jesus was put on that cross, he became the curse. The curse was the sin debt of the nations, everybody. All of your sins, past, present, and future. Including the sin that Adam committed. Including the sin that Eve committed. All of it. Jesus became that when he was put on the cross. And he took on the penalty for everybody's sin. And all of God's anger and wrath was taken out on him. For everything that you did everything that you're doing and everything that you ever will do. It has already been taken out on the body of Jesus to the point to where he was crucified. First, he was beaten beyond recognition to where you wouldn't even know who he was. That's how bad he was beaten. Then that wasn't enough. After that, then he was he was put on a cross and then crucified after not even being recognizable after that. So then he suffered some more. This was the penalty for the world. So all of God's Old Testament wrath and anger and condemnation and rage and I'm going to smite you, I'm going to get you back, fire and brimstone, all of that attitude has been bundled up and taken out on Jesus. He says, instead of getting them, instead of punishing them, instead of giving them this whooping. Give it to me. Give it to me and don't do anything to them. Punish me and don't punish them. Give me your wrath. Don't give them your wrath. I'll take it. You let them go free. So he took all God's wrath. All the wrath that God has to give. For everything that you would ever do wrong. Jesus took that. He experienced that wrath. He paid that wrath. He paid for that wrath. On your behalf. Now that he has paid for that penalty for your sin 
past, present, and future. God can never be angry with you. Never. Because he has already, in, in according to how heaven has it, God has already been angry with you. He can't even punish you. Because the punishment that he would punish you with, he has already punished that on the body of Jesus. He can't even get you back for something wrong you did years ago and make you pay because he has already made you pay based on what he did on Jesus. So he looked into your future. He saw what you was going to do wrong. And he took that out on Jesus. Now that he has already gotten all of the anger that he can get off of his chest. And all of the rage that he can get off of his chest. And all of the wrath that he can express. God already got it out off of his chest. And put it on Jesus. Since he has done that. He doesn't have. Any more wrath to give. The only thing that he has to give. Is love. Grace. Peace. Mercy. Not only that. But the father. Has turned the judgment over. To the son. So God the father. Doesn't judge anybody. Read your Bible. John 5. 22. 23. The father. Jesus said it himself. This is coming from Jesus. The father judges no man. But has committed all judgment. Over to the son. The father judges no man. So you go into the Old Testament. And you start digging up scriptures. Of where God's anger is. And you start applying that to people. Who are living under grace. You have a misunderstanding. Of where we are under grace. You don't know the difference. Between the Old Testament. And the New Testament. You don't know what was paid for on the cross. So you be so so because you don't understand that, then you go into the Old Testament, dig up scriptures to uh to 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 try to say that God is going to get somebody. That God is going to smite someone, that God is going to kill someone, that God is angry, that God is going to make somebody pay. <laughs> because you don't understand what has been paid. Uh, 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 uh. <clears throat> Not only that, <clears throat> but you're going into where the father was judging. But in the New Testament, the Bible says that the father is not judging no more. He stopped judging. He gave the judgment to his son. <laughs> Once again, read it. The Gospel John 5, <clears throat> chapter 22, uh, uh, verse 22. Chapter 5, verse 22, and verse 23. The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment over to the Son. The Son judges. Now the difference between the Father judging and the Son judging. Is that the son is much easier than the father. Because the son. Controls the new covenant. While the father controlled the old covenant. <laughs> the old covenant was the ministry of the flesh. What you do on the outside mattered. You mess up on the outside. Your actions don't look right on the outside. 
You you said something wrong. You did something wrong. You were immediately cursed. Under the New Testament, it's not the outside. It's the inside. And all the judgment is inward. <laughs> So it's not even about your actions under the New Testament. It's about your heart. It's about your faith. It's about what you believe. And if you receive Jesus. And you believe in him. Then you could not be condemned. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So you cannot be condemned. You cannot go to hell and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. You cannot be punished by God and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's not God punishing you. If you're experiencing something, it's the devil. <laughs> Uh, see, see, if you don't understand that, then you'll, you'll blame God for that. You got cancer, you'll blame God for that. You got sickness, you'll blame God for that. You lost your job, you'll blame God for that if you don't understand that God is not punishing you. So you'll be giving God um, all the credit for something that should go to the devil. While the devil goes free. Laughing at you. Because you don't know who you are. And don't know where you are. Under the New Testament. Don't know the difference between law and grace. Old Testament ministry. Versus New Testament ministry. So you're sitting there. Receiving a false perspective of God. Your prayers are not getting answered because you're sitting there thinking about your mistakes and you're trying to measure up to God. You're doing stuff like they would do it under the Old Testament. <laughs> but you're expecting New Testament results. How can you live under the Old Testament and expect New Testament results? You're striving toward a way that's in vain. That doesn't work. What God requires of you now is faith in Jesus. <laughs> Once you have received Jesus, all the satisfaction that there is to satisfy the Father with has been satisfied, settled, done. Your good works is extra. You're just laying up treasure in heaven. But that's not adding anything between your relationship with God. That's done. You hear people say, well, I'm still, I'm trying to get it right. If I didn't get it right the day before, I'll get it right this time. You're, you're living by works instead of living by faith. You're, you're living like they lived under the Old Testament. Without understanding of how you're supposed to live under the New Testament. But under the New Testament, we don't live by works. We live by faith. Under the New Testament, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. Under the New Testament, we're not righteous based on good deeds. We're righteous based on Jesus' deeds and, and his works. And by receiving him, we receive righteousness as a gift. We don't work for it. It's imputed to us. It's credited to us. Without us doing anything, anything, any deeds. So we're not under the law. We're under grace. Now, when you understand that, 
and you understand that the judgment has been turned over to Jesus, then you understand the reason why it's been turned over to Jesus is because he's the, he controls the new, the new covenant. The one that we're under. The new covenant in his blood. It's different than the old one. So everything that you read from the book of Genesis up to the book of Malachi, everything that you read in there, you're reading Old Testament. So you cannot take that and apply that to now. The way God responded then, that's not how he responds now. We're in a different place. We have peace with God. And the ministry that we're now under is new covenant. So under grace and under mercy, what God is looking for is different than what he used to look for. Now he's looking for what's on the inside of your heart. And he's looking right past your action. Before, he was looking at your action. And looking beyond your heart. Your heart didn't even matter. It was your action. <laughs> he was going by the outside before. Now he's going by the inside. See the difference? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so Jesus, because... Jesus is God in the flesh. Understand, he is fully man, but fully God. He is fully man, but inwardly, he's fully God. Outwardly, on the outside, he's fully man. Carries full human nature. But on the inside, he's fully God. The fullness of the Father dwells in Jesus. So, so on the inside, he's fully God, according to the spiritual nature. But on the outside, he's fully man, according to the physical nature. So Jesus, being both man and God, <clears throat> is able to sympathize with man. That's why by the judgment being given to Jesus, by the Father giving the judgment over to the Son, the Son is a lot easier on us. The reason why is because He became us. He was born of a virgin so that He would not be born in sin like we're born. That was the way around the curse of Adam. To be born of a virgin. For the Holy Spirit to, to impregnate Mary. To make sure that he came into this world without sin. That way he would be a worthy sacrifice for our sin. To cover it much better than the sacrifices that they had under the Old Testament. Which I told you only last four years. It only covered the previous sin. And they could only do it every jubilee. But it didn't cover the, the, the future sins. It only covered what was, what was committed from the past. But Jesus, he's called the Lamb of God. Because he's God's sin sacrifice. And his sin takes away the sin. I mean, his, uh, his sacrifice takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh, taketh away the sins of the world. He takes the sins away. Where it's forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, it doesn't exist. He eradicates and, and, and gives remission of sin. He starts you fresh to where it never happened. <laughs> That's the kind of sacrifice Jesus is. Now, uh, the animals 
the sacrifice that they are, they didn't cover the sin. As a matter of fact, it only temporarily covered it. First of all, it didn't cover the, the sins that was about to be committed. It only covered that which was previously committed. But it only covered that for a moment. And it didn't eradicate the sins that was previously committed. It only covered it. It hid it for a while. So that God's wrath would go away for a while. And so that, this, so that the people could experience a little bit of kindness from God. But then, because the blood of those animals was not clean enough, because the animals were sin, they were unclean. That blood could only temporarily cover their sin. But it would keep coming back up. See the difference? So the animal sacrifices did not cleanse sin. It, it only covered it for a moment and it only covered that which was previously committed. Then it would come back up again because it couldn't get rid of it. Jesus, his blood is sprinkled on the altar in heaven and the covering that he is Gets rid of your sin. His blood purifies it. It gets, it gets it out the way. The way it don't exist no more. It doesn't come back up. God don't even remember what you did. He don't, he don't even, when you're sitting there. Bringing your sins up to him. He, he doesn't even know. What you're talking about. You're reminding him of something he doesn't have any knowledge of. Because the blood of Jesus has taken it out the way. <laughs> so he doesn't see it. It's as though it never happened. Now, now not only does the blood of Jesus take away the sin from your past. It takes away the sin from your present and the sin from your future too. So that God never sees it. He doesn't see nothing wrong with you. You see something wrong with you. You let people tell you what's wrong with you. But in God's eyes, he don't see no sin. <laughs> All he sees is the Savior. He looks at you and he sees Jesus and he says, they're righteous. You sitting there remembering all your mistakes and everything that you're going through, you're blaming God for it, thinking that he's holding your mistakes against you. As if the blood of Jesus is just a waste of time. And don't understand that that covered that. So that he would not be looking at what you did. That way you can continue to have peace with God in spite of your faults and issues. And you can continue to have oneness with God and relationship with God in spite of your faults and issues. Now that, that oneness with God and that relationship with God is what will actually change your issues to make you better. Because you need his presence in order to change. But if he's holding all your sins against you, then there's going to be some times where he leaves you. And if he ever leaves you, you're not going to change because you need him to change you. <laughs> so he fixed it so that he can stay with you no matter what. That's why he says that he will never leave you or forsake you. Now that's under the New Testament. He will never leave you and he will never forsake you, but he'll be with you always, even to the end of this age. In the Old Testament, you hear David praying a prayer saying, don't take your spirit from me. But nowhere in the New Testament do you hear anybody talk like that. 
Because as I told you, the Old Testament ministry is different than the New Testament ministry. Once again, that was before. This is now. That was before. This is now. <laughs> so now the Bible says come boldly before the throne of grace. <laughs> but we do not have a high priest who's not able to sympathize with our weakness. But Christ in all places was tempted just as we are yet without sin. Let us come therefore boldly to the throne of grace. That we may find grace and mercy to help in the time of need. So he says come boldly now. Don't even worry about your sins. Sin is dealt with. We're done. <laughs> Why are you still trying to do that? We're done. Why are you still trying to fix it? We're done. There's nothing to fix. Walk in righteousness. Believe that you have been justified by faith alone. Apart from the deeds of the law. And come to God and stop acting like you, you got to qualify and measure up. Stop going by the Old Testament ministry. And go by the New Testament ministry and stand in his grace. <laughs> Stop being so sin conscious. Always thinking about everything you did wrong. Always trying to fix everything you did wrong. Anytime something doesn't work for you, it's got to be because of something you did wrong. Everything's all about your sin. You're, you're, you're restarting everything that he has already did. He's taking care of that. <laughs> so now you just need to go beyond that. Stop worrying about it. Stop trying to impress God with your actions. And understand that it's about your faith. That's all he wants from you. Your faith. <laughs> That's why you got to be careful of who you let preach to you. Because some people are preaching Old Testament. They're preaching the ministry of death and condemnation. They're preaching the devil's work and, 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 and giving God credit for it. <laughs> They're saying God did that to you. It's not God. God is good. And God is good always. And everything that he sees about you is good. You got Jesus? Everything that God sees about you is good. He don't see no wrong with you. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. The penalty for those mistakes has been paid. Do you understand what I'm saying? The penalty for it. Past, present, and future. What you're getting ready to do. What you, what you, what, the wrong thing that you're getting ready to do in the coming days, the coming weeks, the coming months, the coming year. Whatever you would do wrong, the penalty for that, the wrath for that, God has already released that on Jesus. So before you even get to your sin, the punishment has already been taken care of. That's why God doesn't get angry with you when you do mess up. Because he already expressed that anger before you ever got to the sin. <laughs> so you have peace with him even in spite of that. That's why, that's why it looks like he's letting you slide. When you know you did something wrong, but it, it looks like he's letting you slide. I'm, I'm here to tell you the truth. He is letting you slide. Because the penalty for that mistake, what he would do to get you back, he already did that to Jesus. Now, if he was to punish you too, then that would be double punishment. 
He would be punishing the same thing twice if he was to make you pay for everything that you did wrong and everything that you will do wrong. Then, then that would be double punishment because he's already punished that on his son, Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, punish me. Don't punish them. Everything they're going to do wrong, do it to do, Take your anger out on my body. Put me on a cross. Do what you got to do in order to make sure that you don't express any anger to them. No wrath to them. No condemnation to them. No rage to them. Do it all to me. And treat them like they didn't do nothing. <laughs> That is what Jesus did for you. Now do you understand? So God, he's not angry with you because he can't be. He has already been, according to how heaven records it, he has already been angry with you. He has already slapped you around. He has already given you your beating. What happened with the body of Jesus? That was your beating. For everything that you would do wrong. So my point is. It's already been dealt with. So the only thing left. Since it's been dealt with. Is peace. Love. Mercy. Grace. Kindness. And that is how God treats you now. So there you have it y'all. That is the difference between the Old Testament ministry and the New Testament ministry. And as you study in the New Testament, you will see that the response of God is totally different. Not only that, but Jesus is in charge. He gave it all over to his son because his son is able to sympathize with your weaknesses He's a lot easier on you because he has become one of you um, by being um, fully man, yet at the same time fully God. He is able to relate to you more than the Father because he has come in the flesh. So the Father in the person of the Son is able to relate to you with more understanding than the Father direct. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, you're dealing with the Father direct. Not as a man. You're just dealing with God. <laughs> you're just dealing with pure holiness. You're dealing with pure flawlessness. And no understanding of any weakness that you have or any problem that you struggle with. Don't matter what you explain. Don't matter what you got to say. Don't matter how bad you didn't want to do it. You did it. No mercy. <laughs> no grace. Straight up wrath. Straight up anger. You're wrong. Boom. That's, that's what you're dealing with under the Old Testament. Under the New Testament, you're dealing with a God that says to a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, adultery go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more, lest worse things come upon you. But go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Now, if that was the Old Testament, Dealing with God direct. Boom. You're wrong. Now see. That's the kind of God. That a lot of people. Who don't understand grace. Don't understand the difference. Between the Old Testament. And the New Testament. They try to bring that God. Into the New Testament. And say. You're wrong. Boom. God's going to get you. So they're putting that attitude. The Old Testament attitude 
on God under the New Testament. You say, but the Lord changes not. No, he doesn't, but his laws change. His covenants change. And under this covenant, that's not how he treats us. <laughs> because the judgment is not out, outward, the judgment is inward. Not only that, but because all the anger has been taken out and the rage has been taken out on the body of Jesus. He doesn't have any more anger to express. He got it all out. <laughs> he got it all out. <laughs> There's no more to get out. He did it already. So uh, all we have is peace now. You have to believe that and see him in that light. If you don't, then you're not taking advantage of your privileges in Jesus. Neither do you understand Jesus. Nor do you understand the reason for what Jesus suffered. You just watch a, mo a, a movie and you saw a man hanging on the cross, but you don't know what none of that was about. That's why some people are trusting in false religions <clears throat> that uh, teach them other ways. <laughs> but there's only one <clears throat> that teach peace with God and teach relationship. <laughs> you can only get that through Jesus. You know, um, you can go outside and meditate all you want, look at the sun, look at the moon, look at the stars, receive energy, maybe even get a healing to your body by partaking of the energy from something that God created. Not understanding that greater than that is God. <laughs> yeah, sure, you could speak some stuff. Call it speaking into the universe. Calling the universe God. And forgetting, God is not the universe. He created the universe. <laughs> but yet you want to call energy God. God is not energy. He created energy. The Bible says power belongs to God. So God is not power. He's not energy. He created it. It belongs to him. It's under him. It comes from him. But that's not him. <laughs> so when you trust it, then you miss him. And when you call it him, then you build a relationship with what God created and never get to God. You stay satisfied with that. Not understanding that there is a place from which that came. God is responsible for energy. God is responsible for the universe. God is responsible for nature. Did Jesus not, did Jesus not rebuke nature? Nature itself. But well, we see people trusting in nature, trusting in other things, and calling that God. The devil's trick to try to get you away from Jesus, try to curve it. Everything to get you to go around Jesus. Oh yeah, they'll say God all day on the uh, awards. How many of them say Jesus? Oh, you'll hear people say, yeah, I believe in God. But don't you mention that name Jesus to them. <laughs> they don't want to say that. They don't want to speak his name. Because their idea of who they think God is or what they think God is. They got some other perspective. They're saying God is just energy. 
God is just, he's the universe. That's God. Ain't nobody uh, 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 that judges us. There, there's nobody that, that, that sits in heaven. There is no heaven. There's none of that. When we die, we just go back to being energy. And there's nothing. Really? Really? And you want to die and find that out the hard way? <laughs> Better think about what you believe. Because just because you have partaken of energy from what God created and it has helped you here doesn't mean that that has anything to do with what happens to you after you die and leave from here. Hmm. Woo! <laughs> but once again... <clears throat> The Bible talks about those who serve the creation instead of the creator. Serving the creature instead of the creator. Serving other things. Trusting in the Zodiac. Trusting in Horus. Trusting in false gods like Inky. Going by horoscopes. That's sorcery. That's witchcraft. That's the devil stuff. Those are the fallen angels. Those are demons. So you're going after demonical influence. And you're partaking of the demonic world and receiving uh, healings and miracles from the demonic. <laughs> so they give you your little heaven on earth and then when you die you go to hell what good did that do you when you could have went to the creator still received miracles but at the same time after you die go to go to heaven Because you serve the creator instead of the creature that the creator created. <laughs> or the creation. Trusting in stars. Trusting in uh, demonical stuff. Satanic. <laughs> Everything to get you around Jesus. To say, I don't need him. <laughs> I got healed. I didn't need him. I didn't say that the devil couldn't give you something. The Bible said that there's many antichrists that have come out into the world. Many. Many. So yes, you can serve the devil and you can get some miracles. Because antichrists give miracles. They just don't tell you that you need to serve Jesus. They don't tell you that Jesus is the Savior. They don't tell you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They tell you, you can do something else and go to heaven. When, when the price to getting to heaven doesn't have anything to do with your works in the first place. It has something to do with your faith and you receiving a sacrifice. Let me give you another one. Some have said that it's either hell or holiness. Are you trusting in works or trusting in faith? Where you get that lie from? Are we going by the Old Testament or are we going by the New Testament? It's either hell or holiness. Really? Let me correct you. It's either Jesus or not. You should be saying it this way. It's either Jesus or hell. It's either faith in Jesus or hell. 
not hell or holiness. Go ahead and practice all your holiness. Don't have Jesus and see what happens. See if your holiness gets you to heaven. <laughs> so it's not either hell or holiness. It's either Jesus or hell. Either you believe or you don't believe. Either you have him or you don't have him. He is your ticket to heaven. Not your works, not your holiness. You receive him, you have already been declared holy. You have already been declared righteous. You've been seen righteous based on his righteousness. You've been seen holy based on his holiness. So you already have that. You have already been given credit for that, though you didn't do anything to deserve that. That's what grace is. It means that you received what you didn't deserve. You didn't earn it by works. You received it by faith. Another earned it by works, Jesus. And you received it by faith. You were given credit for it. Treat it like you have it, though you didn't actually have it by works. So he is your ticket. The Catholics believe that you're saved by works and faith. When the Bible clearly tells you that you're saved by faith alone. <laughs> Further on, it tells you that if it is of works, then faith is made void. If I still got to pay for something, then it's not paid for. If I still got to finish it, then, he, then when he said it is finished, he said that in vain. <laughs> That's a whole other message, y'all. But there you have it. That's the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament, before and now. Peace.